Good enough. <laughs> <laughs> Aloha, ahi, ahi. Aloha, ahi, ahi. It means good evening to you. Can you say means good evening to you? Good evening to you. Oh, that was bad. Let's try that again. Means good evening to you. Good evening to you. Okay. We're going to sing it now. <laughs> we're going to sing that two times. Aloha, ahi, ahi means good evening to you twice. And then we're going to sing aloha, aloha, aloha. I am Georgette Stevens. I'm with uh, Clay, Builder, Clay Builders Hawaii, the Malama. Um, Pay builders. <laughs> right now, we have been working together for the last I don't know how many months, but it's it's been a lot of it's been a lot of months just uh, journeying and learning different caregiver stories, and we're so excited that we're here tonight so that we can give you a glimpse of what may happen in the future, which we're looking towards November. But it's mostly so that we can just share the spirit of all of our caregivers, and for all of you that are caregivers that have been care caregivers or that will be caregivers, mahalo. So join along with me, it's really easy. <laughs> based plays 
in residential places like Chinatown, Wahiwa, and Waipati, and with special interest groups such as Hawaii's Homeless, the LGBTQ+, <coughs> former foster youth, and domestic violence survivors. We receive most of our funding through members of the Hawaii Community Foundation, including the Atherton, Cook, and Geist Foundations, and federal grants such as the National Endowment of the Arts. Malama the Caregivers Theater Project is funded by a grant from the Hawaii Council for the Humanities through support from the National Endowment for the Humanities and by the Atherton Family Foundation. And we couldn't do this work without our community partners. For example, Hawaii Life Real Estate Brokers generously allows us to rehearse in their offices all over the island almost any time we wish. Mm -hmm. Hawaii's Plantation Village hosted us when we held our reading of our first draft a couple of weeks ago. Olalo Junior Academy for Media is going to film the play in November, and the Kupuna Collective helps us get the word out about our project. We also depend on small donations from <laughs> theater goers like you who appreciate our unique form of community engagement and wish to participate in helping us bring these issues such as caregiving to the forefront. You can read more about the ways in which we do this on the back of our program. We would like to thank Carol Polkovar of our Malama Ina Kahu Malama Festival Chair who came up with the idea for this festival. She collected the new works of poetry, monologues, and very short plays and invited the fabulous musicians, all of which we will enjoy tonight. Only a few pieces were added by our producer, Terry Madden, at the top of Act Two to represent the work Malama the Caregivers has been doing. Carol's experience comes from the celebrated Fresh Fruit Festival that has been held annually in New York City for many years. And we are so appreciative that she is sharing that experience with us here tonight. The new works come from Carol's writer friends as far away as New York City and as close as right here in Honolulu. Carol, could you please stand so we may recognize you? <laughs> so, 
So you'll be seeing me sitting down tonight because I might stand up and then I'm going to do it again. Tonight, we invite you into the complex world of caregiving to offer you a panoramic view of an area we know exists, but seldom examine before it happens to us. It was First Lady Rosalind Carter who pointed out there are only four kinds of people in the world, those who have been caregivers, those who are currently caregivers, those who will be caregivers, and those who will need caregivers. So tonight, through music, song, and poetry, monologues and plays, we invite you into the world of caregiving. And we begin. H, if we are lucky, will arrive, and with the human needs. Here, poet Jean Yamasaki Toyama captures her experience dealing with her aging mother. I write to make memories for my future, to remember our times together. I want her to know I will remember. Killing Devon, killing slugs, weeding, cooking, sewing. In the shade of the Jabal tree, she sits. I watch the lights on her face, traced by the movement of the leaves in the breeze. Few lines around the eyes, looking through space. wipes her mouth with her t-shirt. <laughs> he looks at me. Hard to believe. I have a daughter over 70 years old. <laughs> taste the sweet and bitter of it all. I was, <clears throat> I was afraid she saw her fingers under the needle of the moving power machine. They trembled as they held the clean speed in place under the pressure foot, so near the moving needle. I regret having reminded her of her promise to fix my sleeve. I had pestered her for months, and finally she was doing it. Don't die before you get this done. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I told her.
I am emptying mother's trunk, getting ready for her trip. One folding fan with worn edges. <sighs> Unfolded, it reveals handwritten orange lettering dated, looks like 1921. Mm -hmm. Wishes for happiness, fuku, I think. One frayed playbill, listing the songs to be sung by Hibari. Mm. If I'm reading right, the notations are in the margin. Five embroidered lace trim table coverings. A few French knots worn through, still usable. Three of Baban's dressy mu'umu'us. I remember her wearing them. Golden chrysanthemums. One pearl ring tied in a handkerchief found in the pocket. Blazing orange cascades. Seven immaculate kimono. Smelling of mothballs. <laughs> <laughs> Folded like neat puzzles in 100 pound rice bags. Dazzling pink peony, red ume, white cherry, cascading wisteria. Autumn reds, oranges, and browns, full of dreams. I missed you already, she said, as I lifted my suitcase from the bed to the floor. I don't leave until tomorrow, I said. Still, I miss you. That phrase long ago rings in my ears. I miss you already, Mom. Even though you're sitting in your favorite chair, right before my eyes. smell of matsutake roasted on a fire of dried pin needles on the top of a Hiroshima mountain. She said, a simple story, no demons, no magic, like nothing extraordinary, just a fragrance piercing space and time seeping into my nostrils. I would have liked to have been there with her on that mountain picking mushrooms in the autumn chill. But there she was. But I was still a seed, not yet ripe, not yet planted inside her, waiting for the day she could tell me this story. I, ne I read these poems wondering what she's thinking of the memories I've written for my future. She listens, she looks at me, you know all these words?
make memories for my future. Beautiful. Each caregiver finds a different experience that each caregiver gives. Here is another voice of caregiving of a 90-year-old mother, words by Lisa. health reports claim that sleep eight hours is best. Anything over or under will end your life at an early age. <laughs> so I'm thinking I won't be making it to 90 and not 91. I don't, I don't rise in the morning immediately when the alarm goes off or I've slept my usual 12 hours and it's time to get up. I can't do it. I need to evaluate all those dreams of sleep and then fall into daydreaming. I'd rather stay out there and hide. <laughs> Waking dreams. Oh, when I get into those, into that place, lying in the bed and the cartoons start up and <laughs> like I try to interfere or control them. And it's akin to macrodosing LSN, no doubt. <laughs> Chipmunk chewing coffee cake while talking about the purple tennis shoe as the chipmunk jumps out of the seashell on the boat. Go God! But what does that mean? I try to tell Chuck, my forever fiance. <laughs> he puts on his listening to Lisa's dream mask or his eyes won't blink in the corner of his mouth and sort of pitches upward like he's hearing something pleasant. Or he's just past gas. <laughs> and uh, until he can't take the lack of logic, he just, he leaves. <laughs> I cry out, but Chuck, what does it mean? Just your brain neurons firing, it means nothing. And there is no Santa Claus, and there is no such thing as astrology. He is a Virgo. <laughs> Birdells are predominantly non-believers. <laughs> we have nothing in common. <clears throat> so it is easier to just stay under the cool sheets and hide. Hide from the chores that come from your deep loyalty to my darling mother, who turns 91 tomorrow. <sighs> Chuck and I moved to Pennsylvania, sadly, in 2020, in February. <laughs> thinking we'd be able to go back and forth to our home in Hawaii. Well, you know what happened next. <laughs> and we weren't able to travel and became permanent caregivers, or I should say caretakers, as it turns out. Mom is doing just fine. She is a perfectionist who needs to be heard at all times. In her purview, I never seem to be enough. I can't sing well enough. My gardening choices are to low par. Why do you bother acting? You should write. Why don't you write poetry anymore? You're so talented. And why do you keep taking singing lessons? They, they cost a fortune. What's your end game? The Met? <laughs> How much do you weigh? You're fat, she recently explained in a crowded department store. Oh. Why are you teaching acting? It exhausts you. <laughs> Why don't you get a breast reduction? You'll be happier. This, this, read this article in the Times. This woman did it. She's thrilled with the results. <laughs> Won't you let me just brush your hair? Why don't you get it cut shorter? Why? 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 <laughs> so, I hired in my brain animation until rising is inevitable. Mom has type 1 diabetes, <coughs> recently brought on by her 12 years of surviving pancreatic cancer. She had a bout with Hodgkin's lymphoma, open heart surgery, when a stent surgery went south because the doctor jabbed an artery and the hospital <laughs> found a heart surgeon from another hospital to save her time. She's a fighter, that's why she's 91. She's an Aries with Taurus rising. <laughs> Stubborn to the gills. That's why she's 91. She eats her small meals, usually a quarter of mine, so slowly <laughs> that I'm done. I mow the lawn, email my text.
Jane Wilson's friends and teaching the mural on the side of the house by the time she's finished. That's why she's 91. <laughs> Chew your food, enjoy it! She does. That's why she's 91. <laughs> oh, she's a kick-ass artist. Recently having done a five by five oil painting of masks representing the events of 2020. <laughs> she only retired as a colon rectal medical illustrator three years ago. <laughs> She's been known to excitedly proclaim, look at that bowel, <laughs> with the enthusiasm of a 10 year old entering Disneyland in front of my new boyfriend. <laughs> oh, another favorite one. The surgeon won't get back to me. It's so frustrating. You can't make an anus out of a vagina. Come on. <laughs> That's why she's 91. <laughs> she has a vodka tonic and smokes at least six cigarettes every day. Probably will keep her from living to 100, but I doubt it. So I hide in my dreams and try not to take the unsolicited advice to heart. My great sadness is that Chuck, my forever fiance, and I, you're the only ones who are loyal enough to keep her from being alone. It would be nice if she had more friends and family adoring her, taking her out, even just calling would be a godsend. And yet she seems perfectly fine reading the New Yorker, National Geographic, nonfiction books, her escape all day long probably the best reason why she is beautifully holding strong at 91. Now Tom has a different kind of story. Tom. My husband has ALS. We got married when we could, but we fell in love a very long time ago. When I fell in love with him, I was thinking, oh my goodness, he smiles. <laughs> Look at him. He's so funny. Smart. Soon after we got married, he, uh, it's a slow moving disease that ever so slowly takes everything away from you. One of my challenges is not looking heartbroken all the time. He's still handsome, <laughs> has all his hair, though it's up to me now to keep him that way. Nice clean clothes, hair combed, teeth brushed, and somehow, sometimes, he can still sort of talk and manage a funny line. You know when he wrote comedy for television? He has dementia now. A certain percentage of people with ALS get it. Not everyone, but we won that prize. It's mostly that his emotions are out of whack now. I forget to bring him a pastry with his tea and he'll roar and throw things at me. Not very far, but at me. I feed him now. And yes, I get frustrated and angry. And so I have to keep reminding myself I'm furious at his disease. Not him. <coughs> and I am. This disease, it starts with a stumble. We all stumble, and it ends where your body just gives up. It just won't breathe anymore. I hate what has and is happening to the person that I love. But I do want to be the one taking care of him. Yes, me. The person who remembers him. <coughs> the clever, sharp guy on stage at a comedy club making people laugh. He still loves late night comedy. 
That's the only thing dementia hasn't taken away from him. So we stay up together. That's one of the few things that we can still do together is stay up and watch together. And he'll sit there. And uh, did you know that comedy has a rhythm? And uh, jokes often rely on the right rhythm to get a laugh. So he follows the comedy dialogue, moving his hands. And if the line doesn't work, he sighs and shakes his head. And I smile. Sometimes he's so right. He doesn't always remember my name. But he still remembers comedy. Three times a week, I get a friend to stay with him. And I go to exercise at the gym in the building. Work up a good sweat. Most of the time, it's empty. And that's when I scream. I scream. And I scream. I'm not even sure if I believe in God. I pray. Dear God, give me just a little bit more patience. Another 15 minutes, maybe? Then I go downstairs. And we watch Leno together. <laughs> Playwright Kevin Brodsky watched his friends facing issues of loss as they and their families aged. Some lives they established made it impossible to take a caregiving role. And this is what he saw. The play, How Can Love Survive, by Kevin Brofsky. There is a room. There is a television set, Christmas cards. Brother is setting up Christmas cards. A harsh woman's voice comes from the kitchen. What are you doing up there? Nothing. <laughs> I'm trying to arrange the Christmas cards. What? What are you doing? I can't hear you. If you want to talk to me, come in here and talk to me like a human being. Jesus. What? <laughs> what are you doing? Do you want a mama side? <laughs> no, thank you. Why not? It's before dinner. <laughs> Come on, it's Christmas Eve! Live a little! <laughs> I eat cookies before. Oh, they're dark chocolate. My neighbor went all the way to Kapapulu to get these. <laughs> what are these? I just thought you might have like a little Christmas cheer around here. I don't want things cluttering up our coffee table. <laughs> you could hang them up. Don't you think it would be hard for me to take them down? No, thank you. <laughs> what are you doing? What? <laughs> You're eating more of those things. <laughs> it's all I want. That's, don't you want to eat real food? <laughs> oh, so good. Now, I like the lily koi the best, but they're all good. And that's what you eat now? How will you ever get, get better? <laughs> <laughs> I liked you better when you were quiet. Why <laughs> spin? <laughs> we are in a new year. Sister enters with a tray, and brother takes it from her. Happy Christmas Eve. What is this? You've been 
kinds of salads, pasta and three bean and something else. I forgot. I know how health conscious you are. Now don't forget. Now don't forget your bib. <sighs> Anything on? Actually, they're running the sound of music. I saw it. <laughs> well, sis, your selections are slim. It's yeah. Christmas Eve. Most people aren't glued to the TV set. Your choices are double reruns of Sex and the City. I hate that one. <laughs> it promotes the idea that young women only go after men for the sex. <laughs> Disgusting! <laughs> well, that's why they call it Sex and the City. <laughs> There's a true story of Jesus. I saw it. <laughs> it's the one where they try to tell you he was married. It's crap! <laughs> you don't think Jesus could have been married? When do you think he had time to marry? <laughs> he had work to do. <laughs> everyone got married then. Jesus wasn't everyone. <laughs> Are you trying to pick a fight? I'm just saying. <laughs> I don't know why everything has to be examined and, and picked at these days. And this coming from a lawyer. <laughs> a former lawyer. I know enough to state something I can't prove. Well, married or not, I think Jesus is quite a guy. <laughs> I don't find that funny. <laughs> When did you get so pious? I've done a lot of thinking since David died, and... Good. Good for you. You are such an atheist, and I picked up a lot of it. <laughs> we weren't brought up like that. We were brought up to think for ourselves. Well, I guess. So, <laughs> if, if I think Jesus being married is bullshit, that's nobody's business but my own. <laughs> oh, I, I put everything in the dishwasher. Did you mix? Yeah. <laughs> because if you don't rinse, the dishwasher starts to stink. The helper you got me forgets. He turns on the TV. Music, a sound of music comes up. <laughs> Do you remember when we first saw this? Who remembers? I do. <laughs> it was a rainy day in a big <coughs> city. Christopher. Hmm. Where were mom and dad? Probably asleep in the motel room. Sounds like them. <laughs> God, there's nothing worse than Atlantic City in the rain. Yeah, the trip I remember was Chris taking us to see the sound of music. I don't remember that. You could call Chris. Right? He'll keep me on the phone for an hour, yapping about nothing. <laughs> I never met anyone who can talk and talk and talk about absolutely nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to call Oregon on Christmas Eve to ask him about seeing some movie he dragged us to see when he was a teenager. He'll call me tomorrow. I'll cope then. Julie Andrews and the Trap Children can be heard singing. <laughs> Julie Andrews always made me happy. Uh, you know, they actually filmed it in Austria. Jonah took me in 1989 to meet his parents. They were nice. And I love being around all those old buildings. What? We don't have old enough buildings here. <laughs> yes, I know, but it's not. Uh, well, I think Christmas in Salzburg would be wonderful. Sister and brother are watching TV. Chase music, so long farewell is heard. I don't remember it being so slow. <laughs> <laughs> Movies were slower in those days. <laughs> I don't know why they have to drag everything out. <laughs> Look, why don't you go to bed? You know how it, is. it ends. Go to bed. No. You're tired. No. <laughs> I want to see that part where the nuns rip a part out of the car. <laughs> <laughs> oh, for God's sake, it never ends. 
look, you have two choices. You can go into your room and into your bed, or you can stay here and watch the end of the movie. What you can't do is sit here and bitch. <laughs> <laughs> What? You're not talking to me now? Fine. Merry Christmas. Just leave you alone. Right? That's all you ever wanted. Well, I just want to be left in peace. I don't have a husband or kids breathing down my neck all the time. All the time telling me how to live, what to eat, how to feel. You called. You came over Christmas. You said you were feeling lonely. I didn't call you, did I? And don't talk about putting me away. What did you do with my sister? What did you do with the person I shared a room with for nine months? The first person I told I was gay, who hugged me afterwards, who could be a public defender and take care of her family too. Was it all an illusion? A dream I was living all my life and but now, here we are. I know you are sick. I know I shouldn't feel this way. But how can I cope with a bitter, impatient, bitter harpy who survives on sweets and venom? Mm -hmm. How can love go on this way? How can I keep loving you when you are so different? When you've turned into something I don't recognize. You don't recognize me? Yes, I am different now. Just wait a few more months when I don't even recognize you. Nazis invade and there's nothing you can do. series of falls and infections and finally a successful hip replacement, but the whole scenario took years. Mm -hmm. um, so things are lightening up now, but I, but I know the experience and I know how hard it is to find support, so it's wonderful that we're having this evening, this good support too. Um, so, I've been writing songs for a long time. And, well, let's just let the, the, the words to the songs, I can say it all so I don't have to say much more. <laughs>
of trees. It's about to name it. When it's all chaos, your patience is wearing thin. You're losing your way. You think you're losing your mind. Just
Hello, my name is Tim Mo, and I'm an experienced actor, creator, and assistant to the directors for Malama the Caregivers. We'd like to tell you a little bit more about the Malama the Caregivers theater project itself. Between September of last year and the end of March 2023, Catherine Ann Restivo, Elizabeth Witchman Wadzak, and Terry Madden had a series of talk story story circles and devising workshops with family caregivers. My name is Liz Dixon. And I am Vern Williams. And I'm Lindsay Derache. I'm Georgia Stevens. <laughs> <laughs> we are four of the caregivers who jumped in to become part of this project and are now community actor creators. Caregivers for those who shared their stories with us in order to obtain permission to move forward towards the whole production for November of this year, just in time for National Caregivers Month. And we are very happy to announce that we received that permission. Please consider giving generously to the Magic Koa Bowl at the end of the show <laughs> to help support both Kumu Kahua Theater Company as part of their Dark Night series and Play Builders Malama the Caregiver Theater Project. Mahalo Nui Loa for all your consideration, consideration and enjoy, enjoy the, the rest of the, of the festival! <laughs> Oh, 
Attempting to sight the seagull with weary eyes, bending toward the seashell more slowly. Mostly getting through the days, collecting, gathering your thoughts to apply, to apply to something misty, like the ocean blurred on the edges. 
I always thought, was taught, I believe, that age brought wisdom and clarity. Well, another of life's little surprises. <laughs> so I'll go along the seashore, observe life's debris with a certain smile, wrinkle, and breath. <laughs> George. He bounces on the beam of the joy of life, ever kind, ever smiling, and what a smile, Redford would be jealous. <laughs> and with a wink and a fast word of the charmingest kind, he throws a curve and catches ducks and swerves. <laughs> And up comes up laughing with a jack <laughs> and a queen. Not an ounce of macho mean in a manly sort of way, ready and tan. He sings the songs of the 60s. Put your head Only 60s men can. With a croon and a swoon and more or less in tune. This is the man who dances with the moon. what a life with a wild man really can be like. For a penchant with a wife, with a sassy sort of wife, is a dance in the desert with the dry hot winds of night, touching secretly our secrets under pearly white moonlight. That's my George. That's my George. One night, I came home late after driving around Portland for hours. I couldn't find my way home. I'm afraid. I'm confused. I had a doctor's appointment a couple of months later. My wife insisted on going with me. This was not our usual pattern as we usually did things separately. My doctor is an older man and I love him. He ran all sorts of tests as he usually does. He said I was fine. Strangely, my wife brought up my driving incident. My doctor said it's fine and she's worrying about nothing. But she insisted on having me evaluated to see how my mind was. A young lady, a psychologist, tested me. I did terrible. I have all 
Alzheimer's in my family. It's whispered in the background of my family. I was always afraid of this happening to me and what would be coming in the future. At that time, I was still quite competent. <clears throat> my wife and I never really discussed it because I had made a medical director appointing her as my power of attorney. I trust her and know she'll look after my needs. I used to sing the songs of the 60s and dance with the moon. I was a wild man with a sassy sort of wife. Hmm. And we shared secrets under the pearly white moonlight. <clears throat> I worry that I'll push her to her ultimate limit in exhaustion. I hope I don't push her to the ledge.
living, as we can see, are all different kinds of experiences, but all from our hearts. Here are two more women with their experiences. Maggie was really my best friend, Karen's dog, but she spent so much time in our house that I consider her half mine. Karen adopted her when she was seven and a half years old, a tri-colored Cavalier King Charles, the most mellow, sweetest disposition dog in the world, didn't bark, didn't complain, made friends with the cats. <laughs> she was, it was one of those times Maggie had been at our house for a while. She was 12 then. She and I drove to Provincetown where Karen and I shared a condo. She was so excited to see Karen jumping all over him. He decided that she needed a bath and brought her to a friend's tub. They returned shortly after. She still down. Suddenly, Maggie let out a weird cry and went completely limp. It lasted probably less than a minute, but we were terrified. When I described the scenario to the vet, he said that Maggie had fainted, most likely from being overstimulated and recommended a cardiologist. <laughs> I found a doggy cardiologist <laughs> who put Maggie on five different medications. She had to wear a heart monitor jacket for 24 hours to check her rhythms. As Maggie got older and more lethargic, she began living here with me and my wife permanently. I felt a little guilty thinking I had kidnapped Karen's dog. <laughs> but we, we, we all felt she was better off with the mommies. <laughs> Four of the medications were given twice a day, which was easy, but one was supposed to be given every eight hours. I had a bit of a problem with that given my sleep pattern. I managed to administer it at noon seven or eight o'clock at night, and then 3 a.m. Mm -hmm. At some point, she also needed eye drops twice a day. Mm -hmm. Then Maggie became my pandemic buddy. Mm -hmm. it, was all, it was good for all of us. We were home with her, and she was good company. As she passed her 13th birthday, we could see signs of further decline. She was missing the wee wee pad. Her vision was questionable. She developed Cushing's disease, so yet another pill. She slept more and more. And then at exactly 13 years and nine months, it was time for her to cross that rainbow bridge. Caring for her bonded her to me forever. And I couldn't have imagined doing that for just anyone. But Maggie was like a human. She was family. After we lost Maggie, I decided that I didn't want any more dogs. That's it, I can't do this again. It was too painful. So I said, I told my wife no more dogs. But you know what? Life is about living and about loving again and putting one foot forward in front of the other and just moving forward. So, <laughs> Bailey! Come on! <laughs>
When I was not feeling well, I would have loved my husband to take care of me. He never did, though. He ignored me. Never offered to bring me anything or ever asked if there was anything I needed or wanted. It is possible that he acted this way um, with the best of intentions, or he may not have cared. In either event, it was hard on me because I did need and want things. A glass of orange juice or a glass of water, for example, and just felt too rotten to get up and get them for myself. Now, when I say that it is possible he acted this way with good intentions, this is what I mean. His mother had been a chemistry professor at the university where they lived, but she came down with a permanent physical disability, an inadequately functioning heart, and had to quit teaching altogether. And I've heard it said that she lived 20 years longer than she would have otherwise because her husband took such good care of her. However, my husband said that she always hated it, that she needed to rely on someone else. And she did as much as she possibly could to contribute and be useful to the family, such as by taking care of financial matters when she wasn't able to do physical things. And her husband would do the dishes and other physical housekeeping chores, even though those were considered women's work in those times. I think he wasn't proud of it either. I know that my husband hated it to have anything done for him by someone else, even when they offered gladly. <coughs> and even though he was quick to offer to help others, although not me, when I was ill or exhausted. He would stop behind any car that he saw pulled off to the side of the road, and he'd ask if they needed help. And yet, when a neighbor offered to help us shovel the snow off our very long driveway, he refused the help, in spite of the fact that it would, in fact, have been very useful to us. So it is extremely possible that he thought that I would have been humiliated or felt lessened if he helped me with getting me a glass of something to drink when, when I was physically able to do it, even though, in fact, I would have so much appreciated a chance to rest when I was feeling lousy and I was sick. <coughs> I mention all this because uh, I wonder whether it was painful for him to have my help when he came down with Parkinson's disease. by Carol Pokobar.
not a job for me. <laughs> I work at, at Hawaii Telecom till I retired. Mm -hmm. Oh, I was promoted several times. <laughs> <laughs> we eat lunch together, so many friends. We eat lunch together, trade stories. So many are dead now. And I love being a, much preferred it to being a mother. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I can leave whenever a child gets you cranky. <laughs> you know, I had never had to wipe a Nikolai or uh, tend a fever child. They're on the mainland now. They send me cards on my birthday. Mm -hmm. Mary, do you know where you are? Ah, uh, uh, here, right in front of you. Couple <laughs> 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 oh, nursing and rehabilitation center for my leg and uh, back. I fell out of a tree. <laughs> 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 what is your birthday? Oh. Uh, July 4th. Oh, there's fireworks then. <laughs> what is this year? Oh, oh, so many come and go at your age. <laughs> Did you tell me your name? Uh, could you repeat it? Uh, I must have missed it. Uh, Mr. Rivera. Uh, I'm sorry. I should have been more carefully, I should have carefully introduced myself. Ah, manners. Oh, we all forget something sometimes, right? <laughs> uh, it was a mango tree, you know? I fell out of a mango tree. <laughs> I never fell out of a tree before. Not even slip, not what? I don't believe it had anything to do with my age. <laughs> the ladder was old and wobbly and feathered. I was just too confident. <laughs> I had proved that tree a million times. Ah, you see, this is one branch. <laughs> ah, it wasn't doing too well. I knew if I didn't remove it, it might destroy the whole tree. I couldn't let that happen. I just couldn't. The tree was blooming before I was born. I did think of calling it service, but that cost a pretty penny. And pennies, I haven't got pennies to spare. Now, it's been that time for a long time now. Penny to pocket, penny gone. <laughs> and, 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 oh, you see, I love that tree. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Miss. Uh, let uh, I mean, Mary. Let, 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 let me tell you. Oh, my God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> my mother's mother planted it. Mm -hmm. All flowery trees are African tulips and the fruit. A wonderful tree. Those mango fed our family for decades. Mm -hmm. Mango bread, mango pudding, and just the sweet taste of ripe mango on your tongue. Eating those mangoes was always like a, a celebration. So you pruned it and you fell? I don't remember how I, <laughs> how I fell. <laughs> they told me to my neighbor, Mrs. Wong, uh, looked out the window. Oh, I'm so ready to go home. <laughs> I'm so excited to return. All the pieces of furniture, undusted, 
they must feel so helpless with no one tending them. <laughs> and I want to be watching the parents fly past the fly house into the mountains at night. There is a cat, <laughs> a little yellow guy with stripes. He won't eat, let me near him. <laughs> but he visits every day and eats leftovers. <laughs> I let leftovers I leave. I don't want him to be eating my birds, you know? <laughs> what, what, must, what must he think, huh? Is he going hungry? The birds, the rich songs in the morning and in the evening. Uh, Mary, um, I'm gonna tell you three words. I want you to remember them, okay? <laughs> oh, okay. okay. Socks. Blue bed. Can you repeat those words I just said? Um, bed, tree, shoes. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> they're right. Uh, uh, does it really matter? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> when will I go home? <laughs> Uh, I was born in that old house, you know. I was the baby, mother, father, and the ten of us. Oh, oh. All the beautiful noises of that house. My father was a doctor at the plantation, and my mother took care of our brood. From the bedroom, you could see the mountains from the kitchen the sea. Nothing to block us. Of course, that changed <laughs> when they put in the highway. I wept. I really wept. Could you try those words again? Uh, I had no idea. Uh, um, let's see. Um, mango? <laughs> Should eat. <laughs> Mary, uh, how do you choose your clothing? What do you mean how I choose my clothing? <laughs> I go to the club. <laughs> I used to wear professional clothes. Uh, you know, a professional wear. Since I retired, uh, I dress as I please. <laughs> Well, okay, I'm wearing blouse, underwear, mm -hmm. and slaps. Okay, um, Mary, stand up, please. Stand up. <laughs> Her pants falls off. <laughs> I've lost so much weight these pants go right now. Funny, <laughs> you're not slapped. Oh, the pajama bottom. The elastic is stretched. Oh, sometimes I forget. I, I, and I don't take the time to select carefully. <laughs> I should, but at 92, so much seems like unnecessary. <laughs> They say sometimes you come outside without clothes. And <laughs> once the fire department came out and put out a fire in your kitchen. Your family on the mainland is worried about you. Well, Mr. Riviera. <laughs> 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 Garbage.
very chance, tall building. What? We watched the children and older people to kill each other. Now we started another tall building nearby. Too many people to know, to care about. Do you remember how you got lost in the street and didn't know how the way home? That must have been frightening. You asked me the day, didn't you? Well, I do believe it's March. Mm -hmm. Days of the week are hard for old people because if you retire, the days flow like the alawai and one of the other. When you're young, the days are like an ocean wave. They swell and ebb. Monday begins still. Grows until Wednesday, and when it reaches its peak, and the rest of the week, it... please, I ask you again, when do you think I can go home? You say my family is worried. You said that before. <coughs> yes, I forget things. Who cares if I don't wear shoes? <laughs> I did not wander about the street. I, I, I simply was so deep in my thoughts. I, I lost track of this and oh, this nice gentleman. And your family worries about your safety. Uh, they think it would be nice if you could go to a place where everything is taken care of and there's no danger for you. No, I don't think I would like to go somewhere where I could be taken care of. what my home is like. When I open the door, I swear I can hear my brothers and sisters playing upstairs. You know, only my little brother, Charlie, is left. He's two years younger than me, but his memory, not so good. His candy got him a nurse to watch him, but not me. I'm fine. <laughs> I play handle, of course, some, uh, um, uh, 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 I, I, I play handle, of course, I forget things sometimes, but we all are forgetting and, uh, and remembering. I have 92 years to remember, <laughs> many, many days of things to remember. Sometimes my head gets too filled with uh, drawers to take out this file or that one. Well, you said your nieces and nephews are on the mainland. Uh, all your brother but one is dead, and most of your friends are gone. Do uh, you get lonely or depressed? Oh, other brothers. Gone. Yes, I miss them. Lonely, maybe so many dead. Sometimes they come to me in, in my mind and, and we talk story again. Sometimes my nieces and nephews, I call them by their parents' name. <laughs> oh, oh, my favorite was Billy. He was the third from the oldest. Oh, how we sang and played together. We laughed and laughed all the time. He had a ukulele and played quite well. Then he, he moved far away and I always hoped I would see him again. But I didn't. No. I'm not depressed. Sometimes it's sad to think of all that has passed. Mr. Riviera, I'm so afraid I will die here someplace and that I'll never see home again. I want to die in the house I belong to. I know my nieces and nephews will think they are helping me, keeping me safe. And after all, it 
was my own fault. I fell out of that tree. But Lord, I know you understand. Yes, I should not have climbed the ladder to prove that tree. But the mango tree, that is my past. And we'll live into the future. Mr. Rivera, when am I going home? Challenges and rewards of the caregiver. It's 9 p.m. and I've just arrived home. I've been keeping company all day with our elderly neighbor, Mrs. Kim, who's from Korea. Not having any relatives here in Hawaii, Mrs. Kim lives alone in an apartment close to ours. During these past six or seven years, she used to knock at our door, asking for help to take the groceries up the stairs from her car to her kitchen. With time, she started to forget to take her keys with her, locking herself out of the house. She finally asked us to keep a set of her keys so that we, we wouldn't have to call the locksmith all the time. My husband and I made a point to check on her frequently, almost daily, disguised as an aloha, how are you doing visit. One morning, coming back from our daily walk, we noticed through her screen door that the, 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 her house was, she was eating at, a breakfast at the table, but her house was flooded with three inches of water all, all over. Her answer to our question of how it happened was, was a shrug. But we could see that the tap of the kitchen sink had been left running and the drain was closed. The water had been overflowing for some time. We called a, a restoration service, uh, services company, and the apartment was clean and dried. But two weeks later, it happened again. While my husband was once again supervising the cleaning and the drying work, Mrs. Kim said she wanted to go to her room and rest. A couple of hours later, when the job was done, Mark went down the hall and found Mrs. Kim sprawled on the floor looking dazed. Something was not right. So Mark asked if she wanted to be examined by a doctor and she agreed. So an ambulance was called. After five weeks in the hospital and countless exams, Mrs. Kim was diagnosed with Alzheimer's and severe dementia. <clears throat> then when the time came for her to be discharged, there was no one to pick her up and take care of her. Since my husband had called the ambulance and was the only point of contact, the hospital called us. And we decided, we decided to take care of Mrs. Kim at least until a better solution could be found. I started keeping her company. 
sort of, I was spending about 10 hours a day with her, helping with her evaluation appointments, the meals, supervising her personal hygiene, making sure she took her medications, doing some laundry and cleaning. And at the beginning, at the beginning, she was very grateful and happy at, at being in her own apartment and having company. Oh, but soon Mrs. Kim started having tantrums that lasted three or four terrible days during which she would refuse to eat or take her medications, saying that they had poison and were making her sick. Then she would come back to normal just for a few hours. Over time, she became bossy and confused and she started to mistrust us. Sometimes I tell her that I need to go home just for a couple of hours to make dinner, but then I'll be right back. When I go back, she, she's in a panic and, it, and it, takes, oh, it takes time to calm her down. The dementia symptoms are very serious and Mrs. Kim has them all. Forgetfulness, confusion, disorientation, rage, mood swings, restlessness, wandering and getting lost, anxiety, depression, hallucination, paranoia, unsteady walking, falling. She believes that all of this is caused by the medications, and so she refuses to take them. This is what I must deal with every day, and I do not feel qualified I, because I do not know how to handle it. Her doctor, her doctor has been sending nurses and experts in all these areas to evaluate her weekly. Every day, we have at least a couple of appointments. With her, and next week, we will have an appointment with her doctor to know the official verdict. But the truth is that Mrs. Kim cannot understand our reality anymore and lives in a reality of her own making. Her thoughts go through her brain neurons in an endless loop and explanations are not absorbed or even understood. For that reason, I do not take her bossiness personally. I do not get offended when she accuses me of anything that comes into her head. Oh, I simply feel immensely sad. Yesterday was a nightmare as paranoia, anxiety, mood swings, and rage took hold of Mrs. Kim, and she threatened to kill me if I didn't leave her house. what to do when she comes all over with these attacks of rage. Oh, I feel emotionally drained and spent. The, the routine during these past weeks has been irritability and fury that includes hallucinations with their own facts and stories. Then she has one day of depression during which she does not want to see anybody, and then a few hours of normal behavior. And then it starts all over again. This morning, she wandered out of her apartment during the time I was putting the laundry in the washer. When I noticed that she was not in the house, I ran out and caught up with her. She was telling passers-by that there was an intruder in her house stealing and that many things had disappeared. One of the passers-by had already called the police. When the police came, Mrs. Kim started screaming to take my husband and me to prison as we were thieves and we were poisoning her. My husband took one of the policemen aside and explained the whole situation. Of course, nothing had disappeared. She had simply for, 
forgotten where she put things. Each passing day, her paranoia has continued to increase and now more frequently, she refuses to interact with us. She is also focused that we are stealing her belongings. It has been a real nightmare and she called the police several times. When she does not want to interact with us, I call her on the phone two or three hours, every two or three hours, just to see how she's doing. But her reaction is an angry reply that she does not want to talk with us. If we stop by her apartment and ring the doorbell, she slams the door in our faces when we ask if she needs anything. Due to her condition, it is impossible to feel mad at her behavior. And all I feel is this immense sadness. We do not know how to handle this situation, even if our intentions are the very best. My emotions have been very confused. I have no energy to do anything. And I have been having attacks of deep sadness. It is as if I'm in a deep well and unable to climb out. The only thing that seems to soothe and calm me down is to listen to music and do some manual work. I, I, I cannot focus on reading or anything that demands attention or concentration. What, what anguishes me the most is that Mrs. Kim is a human being, unable to understand any simple explanation. In her mind, everybody is an enemy colluding against her. I'm sure she must be terrified and lonely, not able to trust anyone. Oh, it is a big problem that we hope will be solved sooner rather than later. And then I hope I will be able to overcome it and move on. Something about caregiving. My friend asked me to write something about caregiving. I never thought of what I did as caregiving. To me, it was always like additional mothering. It's like breathing. Sometimes, while bringing air in and out of my body, I need to draw in a deeper breath. Fill my lungs further. Spread myself out. Wrap my arms around more. I cared for sick children. Once, a social worker called and said, <clears throat> we have a little boy whose mother went to the big islands for the week and left him with a babysitter but that was two months ago. And a few hours later, she'd come up the walkway with a hesitant young fellow, eyes all big, looking around himself carefully. The social worker said, this is Johnny. His real name is Raymond, <laughs> but he answers to Johnny. <laughs> I would say, hi there. Johnny said, as if asking a question. Another time I opened the door and there was another little boy standing beside a hugely tall skinny man, a different social worker. This social worker said, here's Stevie. And I looked down to see a round faced boy. He was wearing a big, fuzzy, dark blue sweater with a pointy hood. Offering him 
himself toward me with a big smile, offering himself forward as if he were giving me the gift of who he was. I asked him, do you like hot dogs? Because that's what we got for supper. Each time this happened, this little fellow would be carrying his paper bag of belongings. I bring him into our son's room, what we now thought of as the boys' room. I pull open an empty drawer in the low dresser and tell the child, this is for your clothes. And we carefully place his folded clothing in the drawer. Then I show him to the lower bunk in the bed. This is where you get to sleep. Over the years, we had both little boys and little girls, and then big boys and bigger girls, and we just expand the family. My husband, Mike, and I, we just parented all. But we made sure that our children, our own daughter and our son, understood ahead of time that they were our born to us children. And that the children who came and went from our home were children whose born to them families had parents that weren't able to take care of them. At some point, Mike and I decided to take in special needs children. I had my first child in 1965. When she was about a year old, I got fidgety about being home all day with her. There wasn't a lot to keep me busy. I mentioned this to our pediatrician, Dr. Burton. He told me he had a three-year-old patient named Sharon, who had been in the hospital for a year and was ready to leave. Her sisters were living with her grandmother because the courts would not allow the children to live with their parents. You see, Sharon's mother had poured boiling water on her when she cried that her bath water was too cold. She was burned from her chin to her knees. She was only two at the time. Mike and I decided that having Sharon with us would help us all. Being in that hospital for so long though, Sharon hadn't learned to do things on her own. She couldn't climb up on the toilet without help. And rather than asking for something, she'd start screaming and crying. But every day, we would massage her skin with lanolin and vitamin E. She loved it. She would be there purring and smiling like a kitty cat. Mm -hmm. Eventually, Sharon's two sisters went back to their parents, who then went to court to get Sharon back. At that same time, Mike got a five-week job in Honolulu, so we weren't available when the mother later on decided not to take Sharon out. She was set to live with an aunt, and later her grandmother. When we got back from Honolulu, the hospital calls about another child, Gregory, a six-year-old black boy with lung disease. He had a breathing machine through which he had to breathe medicated gases three times a day. At first, they told me I had to take the machine apart to wash and dry all of its parts after every single use. After the second day, The nurse quickly told me that if I cleaned it every other day, he'd be fine. <laughs> <laughs> and he was. A seven-year-old boy. Ooh, so much different than a three-year-old girl. Gregory, he was hysterical. <laughs> There's this one time I took him shopping with me at Penny's. And he disappeared. 
I looked all around. I wasn't panicked yet. You know, <laughs> and I noticed one of the mannequins <laughs> on the pedestal <laughs> was moving. <laughs> We close our evening with the healing music of Vocalese by Sergei Rachmaninoff with Dr. David Davis on cello and Joanne Watanabe on piano. Mm -hmm. um. Tonight we've explored together many of the real challenges of caregiving, especially those of aging. <clears throat> Some of it has been pretty intense. Uh, so we're going to relax together with a beautiful melody. Originally written for voice, uh, but here transcribed for children. So uh, during this piece, Let's take a moment within ourselves to take care of ourselves as caregivers by remembering and honoring the nobility of what we do. For it is a noble thing that we do as caregivers. So let's honor all who take care of others, both professionals, and unpaid family and friends. Think of caregivers past and present. And let's think of and give thanks for those future caregivers who will be here for us too when we need them, when our time comes.
May I just come on stage, please? Come on, Peter Kirkcock. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> this beautiful bowl is not empty at all. This bowl is full of intent. <laughs> and the intent of this bowl is to show support. And you guys have already done that by physically being here. So mahalo for that. Thank you for coming out on a Tuesday night. <laughs> Which I hope you do. We do. Yeah. Yeah. 